this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. What's up, peace? Welcome back to Rebound and Safety. Today, we are not really talking to anyone. Someone's talking to me. I'm on someone else's show again. Hope you enjoy this one. Let's jump into the intro. I'll tell you some more about today's conversation. Let's go. The problem in safety isn't deviation, it's complexity. Health and safety has gone mad. Health and safety is trying to unpick having gone mad in the past. There's no one solution and one problem. The problem is that we are looking for one solution. Does the structure of the team allow them to flourish? Feel safe enough to be uncomfortable. The environment defines our behaviours. People aren't the problem, they're the solution. Rebranding safety, crushing a stereotype. Brought to you by Risk Fluid. Well, what's up peeps, welcome back to Rebranding Safety. Rebranding Safety does exactly what it says on the tin so if you're new here hit subscribe hit like follow bell thingamajig all of those stuff hit them tap them click them slide up down whatever rebounding safety is brought to you by risk fluent limited so what's that that's the company you might have noticed that's been sitting behind rebounding safety all of these years we've always had a little hint there in our intro you might have seen it but as of 2022 in january we went full time so we now offer two sides of services two types of services essentially the technical health and safety um, with fire safety health and safety risk assessments training any of that stuff we can help you out with and then we also offer the the transformational side we take everything that we've learned over the years from human organizational performance resilience engineering interviewing all these amazing people on the podcast and help companies kind of whether it's culture change whether it's kind of human factors human performance stuff like that help them kind of on their journeys to transform essentially to evolve into the whatever type of safety management you want to be so if you're interested in that stuff check out the link below riskfluentlimited.com and uh, you'll, you'll be able to find out more basically and keep your eye out on that website as well because all the rebranding safety stuff is going to start migrating over to that website now that that brand is is out now that risk fluent is kind of out there as a brand we want to kind of bring everything all into one house so you'll start to see everything going over eventually we'll get the merch stuff over if you haven't ordered any merch there's some cool as shit t-shirts and stuff you can go get them as well so go check that out loads of stuff and don't forget you can go on to risk fluent now and click on downloads there's a couple of free downloads of my kind of brain farts essentially that you can download use yourself tweak it feedback and that's how we did it we took other people's works fed back to them tweaked it use ourselves blah 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 i'll give it away for free and see what anyone else can do with it and then hopefully you'll feed back to us and we'll continually start to improve so today's episode then I, I always get asked the question um, with the podcast and the YouTube channel, always oh, another podcast out, James, another podcast out, are you worried about the competition? And, and I always say no, and, and I genuinely mean this. Whilst we do keep an eye on everyone, of course we do. We keep an eye on everyone, we try and keep an eye on our numbers, we want to make sure that what we're doing is, is working, right? There is a kind of commercial aspect to it, I get that, but ultimately... I genuinely believe that the more people talking about this stuff, the better, because there's loads of people out there that cannot stand rebound and safety. I cannot stand my monotone voice or my erratic style or whatever. And I still want them to hear the message. So I always find, I always like it when there's more people doing a new podcast or a new YouTube channel. But when it comes to YouTube, there's, there's still not that much out there um, other than this lady. So there's a lady, hopefully you've noticed, in, based in America, um, and the channel is called Ally Safety. If you're a bit like me, you thought it was called Ally Safety. There's A-L-L-Y Safety. Go on to YouTube and check that out. Um, it's a YouTube channel, so I don't think she does a podcast and stuff either, but there are kind of longer podcast style conversations on there and essentially she's doing a mini series or a series of safety from around the world talking to loads of different safety professionals from different points in the world, which I love the concept of that, trying to see how people do it around the world, essentially. And um, we were the we were the British version of that. Um, there's some lovely stereotypical B-roll in there, like cups of tea and fish and chips and all of that stuff. Um, but ultimately, it was an interesting chat. It was a fun chat um, hosted by Rachel Waller from Ally Safety, 
Hope you enjoy the conversation and I shall see you in a minute once you've finished listening to it. How's things then? Good. Nice to kind of officially meet you or digitally meet you. <laughs> this has been in the works a long time. I know, right? Yeah, it, it's been in ages. And you, um, like the growth of your channel is phenomenal. Like phenomenal. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's been a lot of work. You, you started, I think, like how long have you been going now? I uh, I started around uh, February of 2020, so about yeah. a year, year and a half, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're about a year after us. And okay. Your channel's just blown up. Like it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, I I thought there was a market for better safety videos. And definitely. it turns out, I think there is. <laughs> oh, yeah, there definitely is. There's still even, I mean, really, I think the only people that make videos in the style, the modern style is probably you and I, and that's about it. There's not really a lot of other people that make a more modern style of YouTube video. No, there's not. So it's good to see. I'm glad that we we were finally able to get together and make this work. Yeah, 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 definitely. Right, I will um let you lead the way, really. Uh, I. My my plan is for my content is I'm going to put this on our on our podcast. So um, okay. I'm just going to let you kind of do your thing, and then I'm probably just going to fire the same questions back at you, um, and then I'm going to put the whole thing out on my podcast, just kind of unedited. We like unedited, uh, like unfiltered. Uh, <laughs> it's in, a lot in... easier time wise as well. <laughs> oh yeah, totally, yeah. totally. So I'll okay. kind of just let you lead the way and I'll do your thing and I'll follow the lead. Okay, that sounds great. So thank you so much for being here today, James. So everybody out there, I'd like to introduce James McPherson, who runs the YouTube channel and podcast Rebranding Safety. So welcome, James. Hi, Ali. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, well, it's great to Rachel, have you here. It's Rachel, isn't it? I keep thinking your <laughs> name's Al. Is it Ali? Ali Safety. It, and it, it's, want, yeah, it's Maybe Ali. you explain that for me. For my, yeah, oh, okay. it's Ally. Ally, right. Ally okay, so. Safety, like your ally in safety. But ah. everybody thinks my name is Ali. And so I'm just yeah. kind of going with it at this point because <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> I love that. I love that. You might as well just change your name now. It's just too late. I really think it is. I didn't know when I was picking out a business name, this is how it would go. But apparently, <laughs> that's what happens. <laughs> Fair enough. Right. It's Rachel. I need to call you Rachel, right? Yeah. Now, you're James, but you don't go by Jim ever. Is that correct? No, it's just James for me. Just James. Yep. Okay. So where in the world are you at today? I am in Northamptonshire in the UK, which for the American audience is about an hour north of London. Okay, cool. East, East Anglia, East Mids. We're right on the border, basically. Yeah, so kind two. of like central, slight, not quite the center of the country, a little south of center, right? Yeah, you know, like as it comes down, you got like the little bum on the on the right hand side. If you're <laughs> looking at it, like that little pokey bit just after the bum, that's east. That's like East England, and we're like literally the inner bit of that kind of. Awesome. Ish. Okay. I failed geography, so that's probably way <laughs> off. Failed geography ended up in safety. That's it, yeah. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit about how you got into safety in the first place? Probably like most people, if I'm honest, uh, Rachel kind of fell into it. Uh, I was a bit of a teenage layabout. Um, so I actually wanted to do one of two things. I either wanted to work in theatre or I wanted to be a journalist. Um, and then... I can't really spell and my grammar is terrible. So journalism was out the window. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, um, <clears throat> yeah, when I went to train to be an electrician, so I could work in theater and then there was a recession and I just took any kind of job basically and ended up in safety in a nutshell. I've been everything. I'm chef, warehouse, electrician, builder, laborer. I've been everything. Uh, and then finally decided, well, I might have a chance at a career here. And here we are. That is so interesting. It's so funny because, uh, you know, there's that saying safety doesn't happen by accident. Mm. And like my reverse of that is like people only get into safety by accident. I don't know anybody mm. who set out like I'm going to be a safety manager. <laughs> yeah, it's rare. It seems to be it seems to be on the increase. Though. More and more young people seem to be taking it up in England. I don't know about you over 
over the pond there and where you are? I think there's a different attitude in the younger generations towards safety overall, you know, maybe more of an embracing attitude where, Mm. you know, some of the more senior people in the workforce seem to have embraced it less and been more like risk tolerant. Uh, The younger generation seems to be more interested in how things are supposed to be done, how to stay safe and healthy and all those Mm. types of things. Yeah, they're they're much more like ethical and moral, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So that is super interesting to me that you are a theater person because I was a theater person in high school as well. No way. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. were you a proper theater person? Because I was just an enthusiast, really, that wanted to work in light and sound. That was it. But what did you do in theater then? I was like properly on stage. I did like oh, wow. stand up comedy and comedy duos and stuff like that. No way. Awesome. Yeah. And then I got into safety and kind of forgot how to be funny. And now I'm like trying to remember <laughs> again. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I, bet you, I just I just hid behind stage and played with the lights and stuff. That's all I did. That's awesome, though, too. Like super interesting stuff. Yeah, so cool. now with your career in safety, you're running this channel on this podcast called Rebranding Safety, which I think is like such an important and cool way to describe what you're doing so could you tell people a little bit about it sure we 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 kind of launched about two years ago it started off with a podcast with uh, a hands-free kit uh in my phone leaning over the edge of a sofa kind of bored out of born out of frustration if i'm honest with the profession in the UK, um, but then talking to more and more people who are from the States and from uh, other places around the world, it seems to be an international problem uh, in the way that we kind of approach safety. And And I, I kind of thought I had the monopoly on, on a better way to view safety. And then unfortunately not, there's loads of people that have been doing it for much longer than me. So I was like, okay, cool. That's awesome. Um, and then pretty much it, YouTube was always the aim, but it was easier and quicker for us to kind of get cracking and do something on the podcast so we pretty much launched the podcast I say we uh, me launched the podcast overnight uh, and then thought I'll do a couple more then read a statistic that said most podcasts don't last more than 11 episodes so I thought I'll make sure I do more than 11 episodes and then that was it really uh, stubbornness meant I carried on um, and then YouTube started which is where I really wanted to be um because I, I like just love videos like like I watch videos all the time same as everybody probably does and it frustrated me that it frustrated me that like if I wanted to fix my lawnmower for example I would watch a YouTube video if I wanted to learn how to do anything I would watch a YouTube video but when it comes to safety there wasn't much there so yeah I had an old camcorder and and used that and that was terrible and the audio was <laughs> terrible and we've gone trial and error since then. And now we've got a few cameras and some podcast kit and it's all weird and legit and it looks cool. And we still really don't know what we're doing, but we've got all the gear. So it looks like we do. <laughs> There's like this phase where it's like, you don't know what you're doing, but you're still doing it, you know? Yeah. 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 I live totally. in that phase. <laughs> Yeah, you, I think it's like a rite of passage. You kind of have to be at a stage where you go, I genuinely don't know what I'm doing. Um, and we've just done everything on a shoestring. Like we were, you know, people, oh, I haven't got the money to buy all the cameras. Like I literally started the YouTube stuff off about 50, 60 quid, I think I spent, which are probably about $80, $80, $90 where you are. Um, so yeah, like we did it on a shoestring for a long time. Yeah, I definitely have been right there with you. And I think it's one of those things, if you have the will and you want to do it, you find a way, even if you're not super pro right at the beginning. Mm. But for you guys, it's all worked out and you made it past that 11 podcast mark, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then YouTube started. We've been doing YouTube for about probably about two years ish. So I kind of lost count. Um, and now now we just kind of just do it because we enjoy making videos, if I'm honest. Like my wife helps me out a lot of it and she enjoys the edit inside of it. And um, we kind of just enjoy making videos. But yeah, it's, uh, it's good fun. I think I genuinely think more yeah. people should do it. More people should make videos um, and, uh, and just put them out on YouTube. I think free safety advice, free risk management advice is just better. You know, it's I good agree. For the world. 
I don't know if you find this, but I find a lot of people who are newer to the profession um, really seem to value it. And yeah. they often don't have a network when they're new to kind of connect mm-hmm. with and ask questions. And so having that available yeah. is huge for people. Oh, totally. Like all, all of our stats and the most popular videos that we do are all like new career kind of uh, videos. And they're just they're a country mile ahead of any other video that we make. So you can see like that generational thing where people are really used to watching YouTube videos because they're a bit younger and then they come into safety that's a bit, bit still a bit old, really, in the way that we, we deal with everything. And they're kind of just going, oh, look, there is some videos out there, um, which is which is good. So, you know, there's there's room for more. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to return to something that you said earlier, because um, it sparked some interest for me, because I know it's something I felt as well. But you talked about having frustration with the safety industry and kind of that being the motivation for you to start rebranding safety. So Mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about like what your frustrations were and what you were seeing? Yeah, sure. Well, I could talk all day about that. Um, <laughs> it, it, for me, it was kind of like, it was more how everybody perceived my, my job. Like everyone thought I was the kind of, uh, you know, police officer kind of, kind of safety guy that just, you know, doesn't, doesn't want to take any risks and, you know, you must risk assess tying your shoelaces and, you know, the, the boredom kind of supervisors, the fun police. And I was just like, that is so not what I do. Like, and I, and I just, <laughs> I hated it. Like if I was at the rugby club at the weekend and I play rugby and we're all smashed up out of each other. And then, and then they'd get in and be like, what, what do you do then? And I'm like, Oh, safety. And they're like, oh, God. All right. And they just all of a sudden <laughs> think you're some kind of like fun police. And I'm like, hang on a minute. We were smashing each other on the rugby pitch a minute ago. But now all of a sudden I'm this uber kind of uh, risk averse person. I just didn't like it. And then so that was one side. But then I, I also was frustrated with the fact that I think the safety profession has generated that perception itself. I think a lot of the way that we've we've managed safety um, we've created a rod for our own back and we've got a perception that we made ourselves by, I think at times being a little bit not proportionate, a little bit over the top. Um, mm-hmm. Now there's a lot, there's a lot of context that goes to that, but um, for me, it was just, it started off with changing the perception of health and safety, whereas now it's more around trying to educate people or more on the kind of, social and and psychological sides of it which and the human factors side of it which is where I really enjoy um, the work and I think that's where we fall down a lot of the time. Yeah I think that's a really interesting point too because when we learn about safety so much of it is in these technical aspects which of course are really important but you can't approach it like you would a machine we're dealing with Mm. people and it's all about motivations and what decisions people make. And so I think that you are so right on with your approach that we need to rebrand safety. We need a new vision of what safety looks like. And so I really resonated with that because I've often felt like you kind of go the wrong direction sometimes when it feels like people are almost trying to baby proof the workplace. Like, yes, we need to reduce risk, but we need to treat people like adults and we need to be reasonable in this approach. And also people need to realize like, just because you're in safety, it doesn't mean you're like some inhuman person who doesn't take your own risks mm. or, you know, have fun or do anything like that. It's sometimes, you know, you get this sort of, um, I imagine working in the United States, like it would be similar to the IRS, <laughs> you know, like you <laughs> yeah. tell people you're an IRS auditor, nobody's like, well, that sounds fun. And it's yeah. kind of the same with safety. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good analogy, actually. I think that's a good comparison. And I, and I think you, you, you're so you just spot on in, in, in kind of what you're saying. And, and, and we need to remember that the people at work are adults. And it always kind of frustrated me that we go on like a I don't know about I don't know what the education route for safety is within in America. But in England, you've got like three or four qualifications that you probably spend a couple of grand and a couple of weeks on um, and you get your level three kind of uh, diploma or sorry, qualification. 
So over here, we've got like Nibosh is the most popular one, right? And mm -hmm. um, I know they do the international one as well, but like that's your kind of bog standard entry level qualification. And it's kind of like there was this weird perception, maybe subconscious or conscious, I don't know, but like that we do the Nibosh and all of a sudden we know better than everyone else. Like, <laughs> hang on a minute. This guy's been welding for like 30 years, but because I've done a two week knee boss general, I'm apparently got to go and tell this guy that, that I know better than him how to do his job safer. And I was just yeah. like, what? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, and like for, for, you know, I'm not saying I was, you know, this Uber enlightened person that just got, you know, it was like, Oh no, I'm never going to do it. I got full on on the bandwagon and I thought I knew better than everyone else. And then halfway through, I was like, hang on a minute, we're not getting anywhere with this. And, um, and I remember a boss of mine saying an old, old boss of mine saying, James, we're doing our job, right. If everybody doesn't like us. And I was oh. like, I, was like I, I don't, I don't want this career then. I don't want to work here. And I, and instead of going now, nah, I'm going to get another job. I just said, no, screw that. I'm going to see if we can do it another way. And just start making friends with people, playing golf with them, going to the pub, playing poker with them. And we ended up making more, more progress. And I was like, mm, maybe there is a different way to do this. Yeah, absolutely. I have actually heard a similar sentiment before where if you're abrasive and people don't like you, you're doing things right. Yes. And in my opinion, like that is just really counterproductive. And it's I'm kind of also disrespectful as well, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah. I interrupted you. Oh, it's okay. But it's, a, it's, you know, the same type of thing we found uh, in the United States is like, you know, you come out of college, you get your degree or wherever you come from and you're in safety. It doesn't mean that you are adversarial to the people in the workforce. Like it should mm. be a collaboration, you know, mm. rather than going up to the welder and telling him how to do his job. It's more like, let's have a conversation about it, some back and forth. And like, we always work, or I always work to try to make it so, okay, this is unsafe. Here are the options of how we can do it safe. What do you think? Or, you know, just making it a bad back and forth because that sort of, you know, disciplinarian role is a terrible thing to have to work around as well. Like you think about the welder in the field. If somebody was doing that, it would just like make my day miserable if I was exactly. a welder. Yeah, and, yeah. And, that, and that is why they don't engage with us. Like that's why the the most and and in kind of outside of the podcast, I, I run a another company where <clears throat> we're like a like a mastermind community for safety professionals, uh, predominantly in the UK. And um, we just uh, we we just facilitate conversations with loads of different safety professionals in a group, and they try and help each other solve each other's problems. And it, it is still that age old problem of how do we get people to engage with us? How can we get people to listen to us? How can we build relationships? Because inevitably, uh, I nearly called you Ali again. Then uh, <laughs> inevitably, uh, inevitably, Rachel, um, we are we're not taught to do any of that stuff, or or in in the UK at least we're not. It's it's just here's here's some standards on how to how the best way to the best way to operate a forklift truck for example it's got no context or attachment attachment to the real working world yeah so those soft skills that really make or break a career are often left out mm. yeah so can you can you tell us a little bit about the content that you're making through your podcast and through your youtube channel you know coming from that place of frustration what are you trying to put out there today to help remedy some of those problems? Well, I would like to put content out like what you put out, Rachel, um, <laughs> because but I just don't have the time at the moment. Or, yeah, or the it's time consuming. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I still have a day job like a, and, and I'm sure you do as well. I think, um, but like I have a full on nine to five day job as a as the head of head of. Uh, safety for for a, a trade association in the UK and that limits a lot of the stuff that we can do which is a shame but I kind of still also quite like my job as well so one day when we go to the full consultancy and stuff then hopefully we can start making some of that cooler kind of um, material so at the moment the most of the stuff we make is talking heads um, so I'm just it's just me in front of a camera being me which is a very relaxed kind of style i'm not very formal at all i'm probably it's kind of somebody's referred to the channel as as uh what did he say unprofessionally professional 
which I thought was probably <laughs> the best way to to kind of put it. We basically talk about professional stuff, um, but we do it in an unprofessional manner. Um, I, I'm kind of very working class uh, English, so my language is bad. I swear, like, and that, and that's you know, some people don't like that, and that's cool, man. Go go and watch another channel. Um, but my my aim is to rebrand safety through just being 100% authentic, just being who I am, which is just a relaxed guy that likes to talk about kind of social and complex aspects of work and risk management. And that's pretty much what we do. So with a mixed bag of kind of basic stuff where we kind of get some basic theory and just talk about it and then sometimes take some more of the complex theory and talk about that. But we've got visions and plans to do some more exciting stuff. And we've done some event vlogs. So that was cool. I really enjoyed that. Um, basically, I would love to be Casey Neistat of safety. <laughs> I just he's my guilty pleasure I love watching is he? his channel yeah so for those of you who don't know Casey Neistat is like a very enormously successful YouTuber right I, I don't watch him personally but I know of him it's just his videos are so nothingy but they're just like they're professional he's like he's a like he's a unbelievably successful filmmaker and stuff but like Oh, they're just like you just what you end up watching a video and you're like, what have I just watched? I've just watched a guy skate around New York City, which kind of makes it really cool anyway, because I'm envious that I don't live in London or New York City. Um, but really that's it. But I just love his vlogs and, and I'm just like, one day I'm just gonna vlog like Casey Nice that, but for safety. Yeah, that would be cool because you can tell a good story, make it interesting and engaging without it feeling like this stiff sort of approach of technical information you know yeah 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 totally. so so I'm curious in terms of your podcast and your YouTube channel what topic or video has been the most successful so far uh, on YouTube that's easy um the two most popular videos we have is uh both on a career in safety so one was a podcast that I did um with another lady called Rachel actually who was the the I think she was the youngest lady in the UK, if I remember rightly, to get chartered professional uh, in the UK. Um, so we had her on and we did like a podcast, you know, put a video version of that out on YouTube. That and then a video that I did about careers in safety are the two most popular by a country mile. Like the views on that are way ahead of any other video. Podcast, we actually looked the other day. Um and I was surprised because it was a podcast of just me talking and not interviewing someone else. And I was like, huh? Um, <laughs> what, what was it? It was, I think if I remember rightly, it was a summarized. We did a big mini series on, I don't know if you've heard of like safety one and safety two. Um, mm -hmm. No. So you've got a, 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 an academic called Eric, Eric Honagel in, I think he's from the Netherlands. He wrote a book called safety one and safety two. Have you heard of like human organizational performance and stuff like that? Yeah. 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 So like new view safety differently and all this stuff. And you kind of get, they get molded into this little group called safety two or new view. Um, and then you've got like safety one and, and, and I, and I remember getting real frustrated. So I did this massive mini series interviewing like all the academics and thinkers and doers of the new view stuff. And then a couple of people that kind of argue against it and have different views interviewed all of them. It took like nearly a year. They've just interviewed wow. all these people. Um, and um, we crammed that into about four months, four or five months worth of content. And then I summarized it in a, in a podcast afterwards, like my thoughts on it. And, what, and I believe if I remember rightly, that's our most popular podcast. Awesome. Well, I'll link both of those. Um, I'll link both of the YouTube videos you mentioned and that podcast episode in the description for people who want to see it, because I definitely awesome. want to listen to that podcast. That sounds really fascinating. Thank you. It sounds Thank like a great much. episode. But um, that kind of wraps it up for the questions that I have. But I like to do just a few fun questions at the end, just to kind of, you know, it gives a little bit of a cultural interest to the video. So Quick question. What is your favorite TV series? Ooh, series. <sighs> yeah. Ooh, probably The Mandalorian. Oh. I'm a massive Star Wars geek. <laughs> I see some Star Wars. Uh, yeah. In yeah. the background. Very yeah. cool. Okay. Um, let's go for favorite, current favorite uh, 
musician or like pop star, whatever. Ooh, current. Oh, I've been listening to a lot of my childhood music lately. Um, current, current, current. Who would I say current? I really like Imagine Dragons. They're really cool. But oh, I would okay, probably cool. say I heard Will Smith's daughter's new song the other day. And it sounded so much like Paramore, who were like one of my favorite bands when I was younger. <laughs> so, I, so I definitely say her new song is epic. I can't, I couldn't, I can't even remember her name or what the song is called. Uh, but Will Smith's daughter, I can't remember her name. But I'll check practice. that out. That sounds kind of cool. Okay, so I have one more quick question for you, kind of on the the same level. So uh, you mentioned Casey Neistat as your favorite YouTuber. Um, any other channels that you would suggest for a safety person? Yours, your channel is quite good. So uh, I would <laughs> say watch, watch yours if you don't. Um, but they're, they're, they're obviously already watching your channel. What, um, what YouTube channels would I like for safety? Um, Oh, that's really difficult. There is a good channel, actually, um, that's not really about safety. I'm just let me just get the name right. But it's more about kind of influencing and stuff like that. It's called Charisma on Command. Um, and that's all about, well, having charisma, really. But there's loads of stuff in there that I use about kind of being a bit more influential, a bit more kind of engaging in conversations. There's a couple of videos in there that are a bit weird, like how to get a girl to like you and stuff like that. I'm not bothered about that stuff. I'm married, but there is some really awesome videos in there, especially if you're if you're going for interviews and stuff like that. Um, there's some cracking videos about how to kind of not, not necessarily control the room, but, you know, feel comfortable in the room and, and stuff like that. That's probably the best one I would say for safety professionals. That is awesome. I never thought of recommending that channel for safety professionals, but I've watched a few of their videos and I agree, like that could definitely be a big help in the career as well. So yeah. great, great suggestion. Well, James, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for telling us a little bit more about your channel, what you're doing. Um, I will link everything in the description below for people who want to follow him. Check out Rebranding Safety on podcasts and on YouTube. And until the next time, we'll see you guys later. Cool. Well, let's flip it then. So I'm pretty much going to ask you some quite similar questions, actually. Uh, I nearly called you Ali again. Rachel, <laughs> Rachel. It's really, that must get really annoyed, actually, because you're, no, you, that's must, why I... <laughs> you must be like, but it's it's not even Ali, it's Ally. <laughs> like, <laughs> I've just decided to go with it. And if people want to call me Ali, I'm fine with it. Because for one thing, I kind of look like somebody who would be called Ali. And I've never <laughs> thought of myself that way. <laughs> But yeah, now I get it. Awesome. So let, give yourself an introduction and Rachel and, and an, an, introdu an introduction to Ally Safety as well, your YouTube channel, and then, um, and then we'll get into it from there. Awesome. So I'm Rachel Walla. I'm in the US. Our certification is Certified Safety Professional, and I'm also a Certified Industrial Hygienist, which I think you guys call Occupational Hygiene over there. Occupational but Health, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I do both of those. I've been in that field, the field of safety and health overall for 10 years. But now I mostly do safety training videos. And my mission is to make safety relatable and entertaining. And I love working on that. And I love trying to take these dry, boring topics mm -hmm. and make them something that you will willingly watch. So that's what I do. I put some of my videos on my YouTube channel. I try to publish there weekly. Um, and then I also make a lot of full length trainings that aren't available on YouTube. So that's what I'm up to. Cool. Nice. I particularly liked your um, video. Where you tested out that crane working at height full arrest system. Thing the jiggy. I <laughs> thought that was awesome. Oh, that was fun. You know, I've always wanted to like fall wearing fall protection. I hadn't really had the opportunity to. So I put that thing to the test. And I'm yeah. so glad I had a really nice, cushy harness, because if you did not, <laughs> you would be so sore the next day. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great video. How, how did that kind of, if you don't mind saying, how did that kind of come about? Did you know the company or or did uh, how did you kind of connect? And Because it was a great idea. Well, I had like made a few comments on their uh, LinkedIn because they have this little model of the crane fall protection thing. And I said, I don't know what that is, but I want one. 
Mm-hmm. And it was like this cute little uh, toy sized crane for fall protection. And uh, over the months I had been trying to make a fall protection video, but one of the hard things about filming is a lot of people are really afraid of liability. So not mm-hmm. all sites will let you film. And so Malta Dynamics, the company reached out to me, said, hey, do you want to partner on a video? And I said, yes, will you let me test out the equipment? And they said, yes. And so that's kind of how it came awesome. to be. I love yeah. that. I love, I love companies that are just kind of like, it, it's funny, like you said, that liability thing, it sometimes stops us from doing actually what we're trying to do in the first place, isn't it? I remember we used to, I used to, I worked with uh, quite closely with a fire service in, uh, in the UK and, um, and uh, I, I didn't develop the course. They developed this course and they had like this massive building and um, where they trained the fire service. And um, basically they had this course where we would send our kind of, I worked for the NHS at the time and we would send our facilities managers into this building where we'd set something on fire. They'd be in their BA full on fire, you know, fire officer kit. Um, and a dead feel what it's like to be a fire officer. And, um, and then you'd see why fire doors work, how they work. You'd see the smoke. You'd see how the, so we call it like fire officer empathy day. So you could really understand some context as to why you're doing it. And then I ended up, I left the company and went to another company and we ended up partnering with that same fire service. And I said, I want to get my housing officers on that course. She said, oh, we don't do it anymore. Cause um, we got shut down because we were scared of the liability. And I was just like, uh. The course was so powerful. Like all of our all of our facilities managers loved it. They it made a massive difference of how they managed their building because they could just see things differently. And yeah, safety ruined it for safety in a way. It was very strange. That is <laughs> that's so unfortunate, but I think that's something that happens a lot. And it's like, you know, you talk about it as being powerful. You can't substitute learning visually and actually seeing things like that. It changes your perception and it's so important. And so the thing with me is my company is small. Mm -hmm. We can move fast and we can do things like that because a lot of it is on me and not on other people. So some of these videos that we've done have actually like we do them as safely as possible. But if I worked for a big company or a big, you know, like some big safety training conglomerate it wouldn't work because we couldn't do the things we do like I filmed a video where I was running a snowmobile and it's like cold weather awareness um ended up wrecking the snowmobile I'm an experienced snowmobiler but sometimes like (laughs) the unexpected happens you know you could just not do that with other companies or we've had we brought in a snake for our confined space video like this giant bull snake to show like things that can be lurking in confined spaces uh and we also accidentally you know started a fire with one of our videos <laughs> awesome you, so this this is the shit i'm desperate to do yeah. i'm desperate to do videos like that it's so fun and it's it's so you learn so much more by watching what can happen and what can go wrong and what you need to know but you know because of liability and safety a lot of times if you work for someone else, you can't do it. And so it's really unfortunate because like we do everything in a safe way. Um, There have been a few, a few mishaps, but you know, it's, it's been really educational and we've learned a lot and we've been able to demonstrate rather than lecture. And I think that's really the key thing. Awesome. That's amazing. No, I am mega jealous of some of the videos you do and I watch it and I'm like, that's what we want to do. So we, maybe you might have re-motivated us. So thank you for that. How, how did you, um, so what, why did you kind of start? How did you come about getting started on ally safety? Was it, you knew you wanted to do it or was it a, hmm, maybe I should do that? Well, I love videos uh, as you do as well. And I, I feel like so much of the safety training that we do kind of misses the point. People don't get what they need to get out of the video or out of the training because it's presented in such a way that's unrelatable and dry. And for me, like safety matters to me a lot as a person, like I grew up, my dad owned a logging company and he did construction and stuff like that. And logging is an incredibly dangerous industry. The fatality rate is 23 times more than other, the average in other industries. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's super dangerous. And I saw cases where 
you know, a bulldozer rolled over uh, with one of the guys that was a, a contractor working with my dad. He, he actually, the guy was okay. He recovered with us in our house, you know, like wow. it, it's Montana, it's small town, uh, you know, people take care of each other. You know, I've been on job sites where serious stuff has happened. I've had to investigate fatalities. And I have had two siblings die in non-work related accidents. So it's just, it's something that I feel like safety gets a really bad name. And it it sort Mm -hmm. of, you know, it, it it puts out this perception like that it's going to prevent you from doing your job and living your life in a way that you want to live it. And I don't think it's that. I think it's, we are going to take risks. Life is risky. You know, like a lot of you mentioned that you play rugby, Mm -hmm. you know, very risky sport. (laughs) But the thing is, like, that's a that is a calculated risk that you choose to take because you love to do it. Mm -hmm. And I want to present safety in a way that is one, relatable and two, helps people sort of like decide for themselves what risk they're they're willing to take. And that's not only in safety. Uh, in the occupational safety, but that's outside of it as well, you know, because we choose how we want to live and we should choose the risks that are worth it for us and that are not. So I'm not only working on safety, I'm I'm also kind of thinking, you know, a little bit bigger picture too, but of course it starts with safety. And I I really care a lot about getting to people, um, getting a clear message across and making it something that is not boring and dry, but relatable and useful. Nice. Nice. You you kind of said something that that, that I'm intrigued, and you, you, you don't have to. I, I'm I'm not gonna. You, you said you're thinking bigger than safety, so I, I'm not gonna make you tell me what that is because it might be you know you uh, the bigger plan that you don't want to tell at all. But <laughs> it, it it made me think of something else that you know, we we're kind of uh, our channel is called Rebranding Safety, and for a long time a big part of what we've done is battle back and forth with ourselves in my brain and conversations that I've had as to do we move away from the title health and safety. So do we go to something like a broader term of risk or risk management or, or do we, do we nail down or do we stay with safety? Um, So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think that, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm working with too, in a way, you know, the thought process is similar. It sounds like for both of us, because safety, you know, if you're doing it right, it should be on and off the job. You know, if you're doing your job as a safety manager, you should also be helping people to think about safety off the job. And so just having that sort of bubble or definition over workplace safety is kind of um, not necessary. It's not really a necessary boundary. It's about Mm -hmm. risk in all areas of life. You know, Uh, one thing that I always talk about is there's this saying that I heard and you I'm sure you've heard it, too. It's risk equals reward. And it's like, like mm. no, it doesn't. Mm. <laughs> like, I've had people tell me that before. And it's like, it doesn't matter what realm of life you're in, whether it's your job, you know, your occupational risk, finances, whatever it is, risk doesn't equal reward. reward. And so it's more about, you know, educating people that there are risks that are measured that can pay out but you need to decide what you're for yourself, what those are. And a lot of my training in workplace settings just resolves around like, this is what can actually happen. Here's the issue. Like, think about it. Like, is this something that you're willing to risk? And a lot of times, especially when it comes to work, it's not something that we're willing to risk. Mm. I I think that's really interesting. I interviewed a lady called uh, Ruth Denya, who's the, uh, she's now the head of safety for production safety at Netflix. She used to work for ITV. Um, so great job. Everyone's jealous of her job, like <laughs> best sure. job in the world. Um, and she's an amazing lady. And um, I, I'm very fortunate to get a, a few times where I've had a chat with her. And um, she kind of posed very similar, a very similar question to, um, to what you're kind of saying is like, what risk are we comfortable with taking to get this job done? And And she did an exercise like cards on the floor and she had like, you know, loss of life, uh, loss of limb, loss of whatever, you know, cut, bruise, broken arm and, and all this stuff on the floor, you know, stand on the card that you're willing to risk to do this job. Like, 
I don't know, film this person getting shot and falling off the side of a building. What are you willing mm. to risk to get to to make that that motion picture or whatever it was? Um, and this was back when she was at ITV. And, you know, it's really interesting the way when you pose the question that way. OK, like, yeah, I really want to do this job, but we need to have a question. Um, we need to ask ourselves, what risk are we willing to take? Um, and I think how, how do you find I don't, do you work with kind of like clients from a con- consultation point of view as well? Or do you just do the kind of training? Like what, what kind of response do you get when you pose a question that way? Or, or do you not I- kind of work with companies? I think that's a fascinating question to ask. And I think we should ask people that more often. Mm. Um, I still do consulting as well, although less than I was doing a year ago, just because videos have kind of taken over. But yeah. um, I, I haven't asked that question point blank to anybody, but I do think if I were to ask it, um, I think that people in people, I'm trying to figure out how to say this correctly. I can see, <laughs> you know, everybody's personal risk tolerance being very different, but I think they would think about safety differently. Like, am I willing to break my arm for this job? And I bet so many people would be like, no, (laughs) no, not worth it, you know, but are they willing to like get a cut or a bruise? Probably. It's it's funny. You should say I'd I'd recently watched, um, you mentioned login. I recently watched a couple of episodes of a documentary on Netflix about logging. I can't remember what it was called, but I, I remember watching it and, and there was these two guys and they basically had brought this massive plot of land and all the trees had already been cut down. So I'm not, I, I have no knowledge about this industry whatsoever. So if I'm using, you know, very layman terms, forgive me. Um, but they chopped all the trees down and they were just this, this kind of like timber or whatever, these trees just kind of laying on the floor. And these guys basically were like, whipping a chain around it chopping it up and pulling it up this massive weird crane thing and it looked cool af like i was like (laughs) this is wicked um and and you know what's funny not once do they mention safety not once do they go right let's do a risk assessment probably because the production company went we're not going to talk about that it's boring af (laughs) <laughs> right. But what these guys were doing in the moment was risk assessments. Like there was this, there was this one particularly large log that they really wanted because obviously the bigger the log, the more the money. Um, and it was like this uber great quality log. And they started saying loads of stuff that I couldn't understand. And I wanted to get it up, but ultimately it was too big. So they were like, right, what we're going to do is we're going to try and cut it down and we're going to try and do this. And, but we, oh, but we can't do that. And they were basically problem solving over a coffee as to how they're going to get this log up the, up the hill. And I was like, that's a risk assessment. They've not wrote yeah. it down. They've not, they've not kind of bureaucratically kind of re- just ruined the process. They've just had a chat with a bunch of people that want to get the job done boom, we've just nailed a risk assessment. And I just thought it was That's beautiful. That's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. I totally see that because in logging, uh, it works a little different in the US, but most people are, uh, they're subcontractors who work for themselves. So OSHA doesn't apply. Um, okay. But that doesn't make the industry safer. You know, like you're still dealing with the same hazards. So what you find is they aren't like doing safety out of a compliance concern. They're doing it out of real world yeah. concerns because these things, when something goes wrong in logging, it goes really wrong. And, uh, you know, for example, I did a video on logging first aid. And the thing is when you're on a logging job and something goes bad, you are the medical professional <laughs> because mm. often there's two or three people out there. You're going to have to call in a helicopter because an ambulance won't get out there in time. Everything wow. is on you. And so it's kind of funny because when I'm talking to my dad about safety, he has like zero interest in any of the technical, any of the OSHA compliance. He just does not care. Yeah. But he's like, we deal with safety every single day. And they do because it's such a risky industry. It's part of what they do. But it's like you talk about like a hazard assessment wouldn't be called a hazard assessment. It'd be t- called thinking about things before you do them. You yeah, know. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a cup awesome. of coffee at the hill, isn't it? Going, how are we going to do this, lads? Yep. <laughs> do you know what I mean, that's yeah. it. That's it. That's safety in a nutshell. Um, but we kind of yeah, lose that, is. don't we? 
It, we do. And it's kind of interesting you mentioned that because early on in you in my YouTube stuff, I did this video, Mike Rowe, who's a TV personality from the show Dirty Jobs, he talks about safety third. Like if we always say safety's first, safety's first, people assume that it's taken care of for them. But in these really dangerous industries like logging and fishing, um, a lot of times people have to take care of their own safety. And so they approach it differently. And that's his whole point is, uh, you know, it's not that it's a side of what we do. It's not in addition to what we're doing. It's like, you got to think of this because it's right in front of you and it's on, it's on your shoulders. Mm. Yeah. I'd like to get to a day where we just don't even talk about it. It's just part of what we do. Just like, yeah. like it's just an aspect of work. Like the same yeah. as they don't, they don't talk about like when they're getting that log up the, up the, the, the hill they're not like so the hill the hill you can tell how you can tell i don't live anywhere with mountains and the, <laughs> this was like a bloody cliff face and i'm like talking about a hill um that you know they're trying to get it up this bloody mountain and you know they're not they're not they're not even talking about it from like a quality point of view but yet keeping that log in a good condition is a very important thing for them um and they're not talking about safety they're not talking they're just talking about getting that log up the bloody mountain they're just talking about work and really that's it like i'd like to get to a point where we just we just talk about work and quality and safety and social responsibility and all of this stuff is just an aspect of work or, or yeah risk management yeah where it's integral mm. Mm. i think it's interesting too that we're kind of using the example of logging as something interesting to look at for safety because it's still one of the most dangerous industries with a super high fatality rate you know, so obviously it's not like the gold star that we're all reaching for, but I do think that it's nice to be able to see it in a way that maybe has taken safety out of this sort of technical, dry, uh, paper-driven sort of industry and into something that's conversational and part of the work that you do. It's interesting because I do wonder sometimes, we have a similar challenge in agriculture in, in the UK. That's the that's um that's our big area that's where we we kill everyone um construction is probably the next one but construction is controlled by big con companies and but most of them are are kind of subcontractors underneath that but agriculture farms are all just small families you know sons on the tractor the godsons on the other tractor you know the grandson and so on and so forth and and um it's interesting when i look at it and i just i think like to your example about logging like and fishing is a really good example. Some of these jobs are just inherently really dangerous. And, and I think that there's a naivety in thinking that sometimes we, we look at it and we go, well, not naivety, maybe an arrogance when we go, oh, that's unsafe. And I'm just like, well, it's in an it's an inherently unsafe job. So I, I kind of I look at it and I think, Do you know what? I pose the question, but can we be, actually be any better? I mean, we probably can. But I don't think we can be as good as what we think we can in an industry that is inherently that dangerous, if that makes sense. Right. I, I think that it does. And I think that it's also an interesting question because it's like, OK, so the people that are choosing to work in that industry, how much of a choice do they have? And in mm -hmm. some cases, it's going to be a lot. And in some cases, it will be a little. But I know from logging, people who work in that industry, they identify with what they do it's part of who they are they love it a lot of the time and if you talk to somebody who logged 20 or 30 years ago and doesn't anymore they still talk about it like it was the height of their career like mm -hmm. something that they still think is awesome so you know if are people able to make the choice to work in a more dangerous industry and you know one thing that nobody talks about but is a big issue is that often some of the most dangerous jobs are also not very well paid. Mm. You know, so it's not like people are getting that hazard pay unless it's very technical. And so it is almost like an equality, almost class sort of difference because a lot of these jobs where people are yeah. expected to take a lot of risk, they aren't really compensated for it. So I don't think as a population, we've ever had that discussion before, like, okay, mm. you're taking on a lot of risk to do this work. Does that make the work more valuable? And in some industries, like there's not the extra money for it. You know, if timber prices are up, that's one thing. But when timber prices are down, 
you're still harvesting, you know, and same for farmers, you know, prices mm -hmm. go up and down, the harvest still needs to be done. So I think that there's a lot of sort of like moral and ethical questions around it. And I would just be curious, you know, to talk to people and see like, you've chosen to work in a really dangerous industry. Like, how do you feel about that? You know, or what's your level of risk tolerance here? Mm -hmm. Are you okay with it? And I think some definitely would be, but what's our role as safety to help facilitate making that as safe as possible for them? I think I think that's such a good point. Like that kind of social mobility is what we would kind of call it here, being able to be mobile through the classes. Um, and and I think that you know when when I I remember I, I got a little I was I was victim to a bit of a witch hunt on on LinkedIn and not so long ago because. Um, I uh, somebody put up a picture of these two guys, you know, leaning over the side of a building and one was hanging off the side of the building to paint the building or whatever. Just a typical safety professional photo and the safety professional being like some arrogant kind of comment around how stupid these two people are. Uh, and I commented saying, I just see two guys just trying to put food on the table for his yeah. family. And and that, that's all I see. Uh, and I got like literally lambast like literally people were checking <laughs> people were like commenting on on my comment saying like oh i'm i'm, I'm half minded to to kind of contact your employer and say you should not be employing this person as a head of safety and i'm just Whoa. like all oh, right thank you thank you very much please please go and do that go and tell my boss that um i'd love to have that conversation and i just thought that you know you're so you're so right like sometimes like we talk about why do people like kind of act unsafe well it might be because they don't see that they have a choice and ultimately it's lose your job and not be able to pay the mortgage or feed your family or just do that job in the moment and think it probably won't happen to me yeah I know what risk I would take I know I know what I would do too and it's funny because we are supposed to take such a hard line, but not look at what the motivations behind making those choices are as much yeah. in safety. And I've also been interested by LinkedIn reactions because I put stuff on LinkedIn and I have thought this is not controversial in the slightest. And I have had like 160 comments of people upset or people pro and against. Yeah. And it's just like, um, sometimes when I put things on LinkedIn, what it teaches me is like, yes, this is why safety professionals get a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's just so to have true. some compassion for the workers who are making that choice, you know, and are, you know, to say, hey, they're trying, they're doing the best they can. And are we providing them the resources to make better choices for themselves? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. W one, one last question from me, uh, Rachel, what's the favorite piece of content that you have made? Because you've made some pretty cool last content. So what's the most uh, fun you've had making a video? Well, I actually really like the mindfulness at work video that I did. That one hasn't really taken off, but I just thought it was fun and interesting and a different approach. I really, I actually learned a lot from doing it. So maybe that's part of it too, but I like the way that that one flows. And then I did a video called, uh, I think it was like lessons we can learn about safety culture from the TV show, The Office, mm. the American nice. version, of course. Obviously. <laughs> Yeah. And I think that one's super fun, but it does have a copyright claim on it because it has so many clips of the office in it. And I haven't bought it just because I don't have the time or resources to, but um, I think that one's super fun. I think mm. that one is like maybe one of the most fun ones I've done. So yeah, yeah those are my two favorites. I've used a lot of stuff uh, from the office actually in training or workshops or, or kind of learning teams <laughs> or anything like that. Loads of stuff because that's the beauty. Of, and it's funny you say you come from a comedy background, like that's the beauty of comedy, isn't it? It calls out those, those everyday things. And actually we find it funny because it's stating what we all know, but, but that we just don't do it. Like there's a great one in the American office where he's like the fire marshal and he basically sets fire to the office and and like <laughs> yeah. and everyone freaks out. And I'm I, I use that all the time. I've got some fire marshal training coming up, actually. I might I might use it. But you know, I used to use that all the time in the NHS, being like, this is your job. And everyone would laugh and stuff. And I'd be like, but what the guy's doing is trying to do a good thing. Um, but and, and then I kind of get into a conversation around it off the back of that, which we won't go into. But yeah, it's 
Yeah, that's the one where Dwight like starts a fire to like bring the point home, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they end up having to yeah. like evacuate the building. He tries to smash the window open. There's a guy <laughs> looting the, the vending machine. It's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. So the point good. is like we need to train in a way that brings it to reality a little bit better without burning down the building. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. I shall link all of the, the stuff you've mentioned in the description below. Um, but thank you very much for your time. And um, yeah, thank, I'd like, it's great to finally connect with you because uh, we've been kind of keeping an eye on you, obviously, as the competition. Um, we've been <laughs> keeping an eye on you and, and watching your stuff and loving your videos. And yeah, it was just great to kind of digitally meet you. Yeah, definitely. I'm so glad we were finally able to get together. And this has been a really fun conversation for me. It's so interesting to pick your brain and just to kind of talk to somebody who's, you know, working towards the same goal in the end. So that's really nice to see and really nice to get to know you a little bit. So thank you for having me on. No, definitely. One day, maybe if I'm in America or you're in England, we'll do a little collab or something. Little yeah, safety absolutely. YouTubers meet up. You know, that'd be cool. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, nice cool. One. Thanks so much. Okay, peeps. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Rachel. Don't forget to check out her channel, um, but only do that if you've subscribed to mine first, please. Because if you're here and, and I'm sending you over there, like, I mean, it's a fair trade. You should be subscribing to mine, surely. First. Don't forget to check out riskfluentlimited.com. We've got technical services and transformational services that we can help you out with. Um, don't forget to check out downloads and merch and stuff and, and keep an eye out for that transition from rebroundingsafety.com over to riskfluentlimited.com. But otherwise, I should catch you next week. Safe. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the host and its guests and do not necessarily reflect the position of the companies. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are examples only based on limited and dated open source information and should not be utilised in real life as the only solution available. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the companies. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic or otherwise, without prior written permission from James McPherson.